Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our online workshop, The Importance of Building Resiliency. My name is Natasha Bayes, and I'm the Education and Training Coordinator for School on Wheels. Presenting on this important topic today is Renee Longin, who's had worked with children and families in crisis for over 20 years and is also a wonderful School on Wheels tutor. Renee will be talking about the importance of resiliency and sharing strategies that can help both students and tutors be more resilient. So for the purpose of sound quality, all participants are currently muted. You have the ability to ask questions at any time using the questions pane on the side. Simply type in your question and hit send. We're going to wait until the end to answer questions, but you can either jot them down and enter them later, or you can enter them as we go, and then we'll um, select the order once we get towards the end. So um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Renee. I really, really appreciate you being here. Um, you know, you have a lot of expertise on this topic, and I think it's um, something that's really beneficial for our tutors. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you, um, thank you all for participating. Um, yes, I think that resiliency is um, something that is very important to the kids and the families that we work with, as well as something that's incredibly important to. Um, to us as tutors and to us um, as people who work with children and families who are in difficult situations. Um, and talking about resiliency today, one of the main themes that's going to keep coming up is relationships. Um, it is impossible to have resiliency without having some type of relationship. So I want to begin the training. Um, or the presentation, or the conversation, whatever we want to call it, I kind of like conversation, um, and talking about what resiliency is and what resiliency is not. Um, I think Natasha gave a really good definition of resiliency in her email, talking about it's the ability to overcome challenges and bounce back. And I kind of like the visual of thinking of bouncing back, because if you think about something that bounces back, it has to have something to bounce back off of. So in thinking about our kids um, and, and building some of these skills in them, I think it's important to think of the fact that they need, they need us almost in place to be that thing that can help them bounce back. Um, they need you know, the community, they need their families, they need people in their lives that they can bounce back from. So that, again, is a tie-in with relationships being so important. Because without those things there, there is nothing um, to give them that ability to bounce back. Um, I think resiliency actually is, is kind of misunderstood, especially in children. I think in children, sometimes we see kids who seem to be handling very difficult situations well or with almost no impact at all. And it's easy to think that that's resiliency, and sometimes that is. Um, and sometimes that's the, the impact of trauma um, just sort of numbing them out. Um, so resiliency is not, how do I want to say that? It's, it's, it's not, re not responding to the problem. Okay, that didn't sound exactly right. <laughs> kids, who have re kids who are resilient are impacted by their life. You know, they may have times that are difficult for them. They have times that are challenging, and they will react to those times. And I think sometimes we see that as tutors, kids who come into sessions who are just exhausted, or kids who come into sessions who are in a really bad mood, and maybe they share that with us. Um, kids who just get, you know, have a really low tolerance for frustration. Um, again, these kids are just as capable and possibly more capable of being resilient and or in resiliency than kids who just appear numb. So it's really important to remember that resilient people do go through stress. They are impacted by life. Um, and that resiliency is something we all need. We all are going to face challenges in our life, um, and we all need to be able to find a way to kind of bounce back from that challenge. I think there's a big myth that resiliency in some way is this um, not feeling anything, not needing anybody, just the stiff upper lip, and that's absolutely not what it is. Um, I think particularly for our kiddos, resiliency matters a lot because what is the, the, um, the challenges that they face are huge. 
they don't have a lot of stability in their lives, either in their community, in their school, or with their family. Um, they're pretty much not seen by larger societies. A lot of the families we deal with um, really don't make an impact. Um, I have a neighbor whose kiddos go to the same school that a lot of kids from a shelter go to, and in talking about it, you know, you can tell that he, he feels, you know, really concerned for these kids, but it really doesn't go beyond that. They're, they're still pretty much invisible because of the way they come and go in the school. They're there and then they're gone and then they're there and then they're gone. So um, I do think that there's definitely a visibility issue with our kiddos. Um, they have very limited opportunities and then they're exposed to a number of additional um, factors such as poverty and violence and substance abuse. So all of those things, the invisibility, the loss of social connections, the exposure to um, very stressful environments and family situations increase the need for resiliency in our kids. But at the same time, those same factors kind of take away those conditions that lead to resiliency. Um, because one of the, um, the main factors, as we'll see in a moment, in resiliency is having connections. Um, that's huge. That's huge. And so a lot of our kids don't have those connections. Um, so that's one reason why it matters so much, I think, to our children. So um, the seven C's of resiliency were developed by Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg. And I just kind of like this because, again, I'm a visual person. So um, having kind of the C's that I you know, can think about helps me a lot. And we're going to talk about these in turn. Connection, again, which is relationship, is the, the first one we'll discuss. And it's also one of the most important ones. Um, control, having a sense that um, your environment is not random and that um, there is some stability there. We'll also discuss competency, feeling like that you, you know, are able to achieve things in your life, developing confidence in your skills, um, developing coping skills, which we as tutors also mirror, and um, being able to contribute to the world is an important factor for kids and for tutors, and character, developing a sense of character. Um, and the quotes here are actually from Dr. Ginsburg, and I think they're relevant um, that young people live up and down to the expectations we set for them. And I think we see that as tutors all the time, that there have to be some expectations for our kids, and we have to let them know that we think that they can do it, that we believe that they can do it. Um, but at the same time, that has to be really handled very flexibly by us because, you know, our kids come to us from different circumstances and different situations. And, you know, with a number of children that I've worked with, every time I meet with them, it's like I'm stepping into a new situation depending upon what happened at school or what happened in their home life during the past week. Um, so we do have to set those expectations, but do it realistically. I think that's also very true for ourselves, that we have to set realistic expectations. Um, and also what we do to model healthy resiliency strategies for our kids is more important than anything that we say to them. Because as we know, kids tend to do um, what they see, not what we say. So again, our value as a tutor modeling skills is huge. So when we are going through this training, one of the things that I put down in the bottom is I put at the bottom of each slide, and um, you know, you'll get it on your outline, is kind of a challenge for you to develop some um, resiliency skills with your student in session, and then just a separate challenge for the tutor to kind of work on developing some of your own resiliency skills you know, outside of the session and through the week. Um, so we're going to start with connection. So the research in dealing with kids in trauma and kids in difficult situations has shown for a very long time that a strong relationship with at least one positive person can make a difference. Um, I used to do adult survivor of sexual abuse groups and it was, at first it was really surprising to me to hear sometimes 
the participants talk about that having relationship with one person, it might have been a teacher, it might have been the school nurse, it might have been a neighbor, um, really made a difference in how they were able to deal with and survive and even thrive um, coming from that type of trauma. I think the same is with our kids, and I think that research definitely, um, you know, hears that bears that out. The thing about having a connection is that um, connections are what give meaning to our lives. That's actually from Brene Brown, who's an author who's wrote, wrote written recently a number of um, really incredible books, and she does some TED talks on vulnerability and developing. Um, just developing resilience. Um, so she's she's really cool, and I have her listed as a, at the bottom of the handout as somebody um, that you can look up. So you don't need to write down her name. It's on your handout. But she, she really does talk a lot about how being connected to other people is just part of the human experience. So again, I, I can't overstate the importance of the relationship. Um, separate from, you know, doing homework or even learning skills, it's the foundation is the relationship. And um, well, I seem to have forgotten his name, Dan Siegel, who is also a child psychiatrist whose work I really like. And again, he's listed at the end also. Um, he does work on uh, the neurobiology, basically the neurocircuitry of the brain. And what his research is showing is that um, relationships, so being in relationship with another person activates the same part of the mind that is activated when we are engaged in learning or when we're highly motivated. So pretty much what he's saying is that the relationship and motivation and learning all impact the same area of the brain. So learning, if you kind of extrapolate learning, therefore change happens through and enduring that relationship. So the learning that's going to happen with your student happens basically in that relationship that's going on. So if that relationship's absent with your student, the other um, skills are probably going to be much more difficult to, to create or to help them with their math or their science or whatever they're working on. And one of the most important factors in um, forming a relationship with anyone, and especially, again, I think the kiddos that we work with, is being present. It's very hard to be 100%, well, it's impossible to be 100% attentive to a relationship. It's very difficult, I think, to even be 50% present in a relationship. Um, and I think it's important to know the factors that kind of um, cause it, cause that difficulty um, from our perspective as tutors. So being present, I mean, you're, what I mean by that is that you're sitting there with your child that you're tutoring, and from the minute you sit down, you're 100% invested in that relationship and what's happening in the connection between you and your student. Um, not thinking about, you know, the environment, not thinking about things that you've got to do at home, things that they're, they brought from school. Are you, you are thinking about that, but you really focused on them. Um, and I think it's important to know the challenges of that so that we'll know them when they come up. And as a tutor, I think one of the hardest things one of the reasons it's hardest for me to be present with my student is that I have unrealistic expectations of myself. Um, you know, my expectation may be walking in that we're going to get all the homework done. And that rarely happens. Um, we're with our kids for one hour a week. My expectation may be that, um, you know, my, my child's going to do much better than I thought they were. Um, you know, the expectations of the school teacher, the expectations of the parent, we carry all of those, the expectations of ourselves, we carry all of those into that session with us. 
So it's really, really important to uh, make sure that those are realistic and realize that what we can do for that hour is be present with that child and help them work through what they need to work through. Um, I think that you know going along with the unrealistic expectations is the fear of not being good enough, fear of making a mistake. Brene Brown calls it shame leakage. Um, you know, I I have met with kids before who do math that I'm not good at, and so I'm like, oh my gosh, do, how do I fake my way through this? Um, I tried that a few times and it didn't work. So then what I started doing with students is just letting them know, okay, so this is kind of a difficult subject for me, so I'm going to need a lifeline. So I would set up to have someone. At that time, it was my daughter who was in high school that I could call and say, okay, we're working on this. You know, can you help us through this? So, you know, that, again, that's kind of accepting that I don't know math that well and I'm going to struggle through it, and at the same time setting up a problem-solving skill for that. Um, I think sometimes with our kids, I have down on the, um, the handout an unwillingness to feel the pain of others. I don't mean that in that we're closed off and we don't want to deal with it. I think sometimes the issues that our kids are struggling through, the kids that we see as tutors are struggling through, are some of the same issues that maybe we struggled through in middle school, our elementary school, um, are simply, you know, again, our population um, the children we work with are so oftentimes on the outside of what's going on at school or on the outside of the popular groups. Um, so I think sometimes that, that, that sense of, of shame in them that they have and that sense of not belonging can really touch off our issues. So it's really important, you know, to notice kind of if, hmm, is that bothering me because that's, that's kind of hitting a sore spot in me. Um, I think it's also easy to not be present by getting angry at, you know, either the parents um, because of the situation that it seems like they put this child in or the teachers because sometimes the teachers, um, I think, can come off, well, it's been my experience that sometimes teachers come off as being very callous. Um, but again, I think that's because they're lots of times emotionally overwhelmed by these children because they see them and then they disappear, never to be seen again. And these teachers do form relationships with their kids. So I think it can be easy to be, become easy to uh, be angry at teachers or at society. And again, those, those may be appropriate places to put some of our anger and, you know, places to put activity. But when we're sitting down with our child in session, that needs to not be a part of our session because that's going to become a out in us um, and that's going to put distance between us and the child. So um, for my tutor challenges, what I have as far as being connected to your child would be um, to be present. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to take about five minutes, you know, ten if you can, before you even start to meet with your kid, before your session, and just sort of ground yourself sort of taking a couple of deep breaths, let go of what's going on in your life, um, you know, the traffic jam you were stuck in on the way to the session, um, maybe the librarian you don't like, <laughs> whatever those issues are, just taking some time to let go of them. And then during the session with your kids, notice if there are times when you kind of get lost and you're not paying attention to going what's going on with them or what they're saying. And then try to figure out, you know, how come? I kind of zoned out there for a minute. What was going on with me, you know? Um, and I think that those are ways to stay connected. Um, and one way to practice that is the tutor tip is strengthening your connection to others. You know, practice really forming relationships with people. A checker at the grocery store, um, the person behind you in line at the post office. Really kind of forming that connection because again. Um, I think a lot of people, I mean, we talk about kids being invisible, the kids and families that we work with, um, and I think a lot of people in life are kind of invisible, and the more that we become connected to computers and can do everything online, um, while that's great, I think it really does kind of weaken our skill in making and forming relationships. And, um, 
from a neurobiological standpoint, that ability to form relationships, the area of our brain that that exercises, if you will, is hugely important for our kids and for us. Um, I hope this is making sense. And again, we'll do questions um, at the end. But basically, connection is your relationship. And the connection is an incredibly important part. It's the most important part of forming resiliency or developing resiliency. Um, control is another um, area that um, he talks about, that Dr. Ginsburg talks about. And control, I think, is really important um, because we're dealing with kids who don't have a lot of stability in their life. Maybe, um, you know, things change often. They move often. Um, they change schools often. So I think keeping that hour that we're with them very structured um, makes it much less stressful for them and for you as the tutor. Um, and if they kind of know how it's going to go and they know how this hour is going to pan out and they, they know the game play, the game plan, excuse me, then I think they can focus more on, you know, what we're talking about and can receive that information more easily. I also think it's really important with our kids, particularly to be consistent, um, you know, to be consistently on time when we can, although, you know, sometimes we can't, but to be consistently on time, to be um, consistently a safe person, to just, just be consistent, because um, they don't have a lot of consistency in their lives. And again, consistency can add to that sense of control, which adds to safety. So um, one of the things that I think is really important with our kids is to have emergency plans in place. So discuss with them, you know, when you first meet with them and, you know, what will happen if you can't be there. Um, you know, Sometimes there are situations that arise really quickly, so maybe you don't know you're not going to be able to make it until, you know, that day. So figuring out a way to work with them to understand what will happen if you're not going to be there. What will happen if your kids can't be there? Because I think sometimes the kids that we meet with um, feel really bad if they miss a tutoring session, especially if it's someone you've been meeting with for a while. They may feel like they're letting you down. So let them know, you know, that sometimes that's going to happen and that you're okay with it. So really creating as much of an environment as possible with no surprises, but at the same time <laughs> kind of planning for those surprises and just talking to your student about it. Um, so my challenge is in working with your student was would be to work with them to develop a way to start your session and a way to end your session. Um, because, again, I think that gives the session a nice structure. I think you can get more work done. I think that it allows them connect, but to connect better to you because there's not a long time spent thinking about, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen next? What's she going to ask me next? What's he's gonna, what is he going to want me to do next? Because, um, again, we have kids who are, I think, highly sensitive in the classroom area of not being able to figure out exactly what what's gone on because often they've changed schools a lot and kind of having to guess. So a lot of energy goes into that. So if we can take some of that out, it's, it's a good idea. So, um, you know, a, a beginning, the way you begin a session and you tell the kid, we're going to begin each session by talking about how your day was for just a few minutes. And then we'll end the session by, um, you know, discussing what your plans are for tomorrow. Or, you know, just coming up with something that works for you two and having them be a part of that. And um, I think it's important for us as tutors to have our beginning and ending um, rituals too for a session. So, again, taking the five minutes before you go in to kind of ground yourself, that can be a very nice beginning um, ritual for the tutor. And at the ending, maybe taking a five-minute walk. Um, you know, sometimes a lot, especially as your relationship increases with your child, those sessions can sometimes feel very heavy. Um, so, yeah, taking a walk afterwards, developing some way to let go of that session, I think, is important also. Um, competency is just, you know, this one I think we all know. I think it's one of the reasons we became tutors. It's to help the child see their strengths. 
you know, to help them recognize what's the strength in them. Um, and sometimes that can be difficult, and sometimes it may be something like pointing out that they picked out an interesting book. You know, it can be a challenge, but I think it's really important that we really help that child build on their strengths and not on their weaknesses. Um, empowering the students to make choices when possible. Um, the communication skills, I mean, all those things I think we know, I think is a tutor challenge would be for each session to identify at least one strength and choice making opportunity for the student. Um, the strength part can be easier. Um, I think that that's pretty easy to do if we think about it. But to really formalize it and put it in a way that every session you're going to say something to the student that really focuses on something positive about them. Um, and I think that comes pretty natural to most of us. Um, the choice making opportunities are more difficult and I think they require some pre-thought like what are ways that I can give a child choice during um, the tutoring session, especially when you're at a library um, or when you have, you know, X amount of homework to make through. So that kind of, you know, requires some, some forethought. So, you know, sometimes it may be, you know, letting a kid decide what they want to start on first. Um, easy ones are letting kids pick out books and things like that. Um, but it, it can be a little challenging to come up with ways for them to make choices, although it's very important because that's going to build their sense of competency. Um, and the tutor tip on this one is, you know, identify two strengths in yourself daily. Because anything that we do with ourselves is going to be much easier for us to do with our kids. And also if we are getting in the habit of seeing our strengths, um, that, that's, that skill is going to be something the kids see in us too. Um, confidence. Confidence is a lot like the competency, um, but it's different too in that um, one of the most important things with the confidence, confidence, sorry, is um, setting realistic expectations. And I know we talked about that at the beginning in the relationships, um, and it is a theme that's going to kind of run through building resiliency, but it's it's very difficult to have a sense of resiliency if the expectations are something that you can't meet. Um, and again, I think that the difficulty in setting expectations for us as tutors, okay, well this is just speaking of my, as myself, um, the difficulty I had is that there are a lot of expectations that come from other places. There are expectations that come from teachers, that come from the school district, that come from the environment you're meeting in. And um, those may or may not fit your student. They may or may not fit you. So it really, I think, requires kind of sorting all that out and figuring out what is a realistic expectation for this student at this time in this session. And also to always be really honest in your praising. Like if you are pointing out something that a child does really well, a competency, um, you know, make sure it's honest because kids can spot almost immediately if it's not, um, especially the population we deal with. These children are really um, very environmentally savvy. They have to learn to read their environments. They have to learn to read the people in their environments. So I think that, that they can pick out when we're not being genuine with them very quickly. Um, yeah, and just coming up with obtainable goals. So the challenge would be to help your student identify one main goal per session, which could be a part of your beginning ritual, that we're going to develop a goal for this session. And that's something that you two will negotiate and come up with. Um, my tip is to you as a tutor to also identify one goal per session for yourself. And that can be a number of things. Maybe that means that you're, you're not going to get frustrated um, or you're going to try to keep your frustration in check again with the environment that you're in. Or if you have a child who maybe has a mannerism that drives you nuts, um, that you're going to kind of keep that in check and realize that that's yours and not important to what the work that you're doing right there. Um, so that's confidence. That's helping to build that up. 
contribution. Um, and again, so many of these interlap. Contribution is kind of allowing the student to have input into the process. Um, and that goes back to setting up the beginning and ending rituals, setting up expectations, um, really engaging them in that piece of it so that they feel some ownership of it because it's going to, for one thing, make your session much better. Um, it also, you know, getting the child to share with you about their world. And I think this is particularly difficult when you get into adolescence um, because they're not big on sharing. So maybe it doesn't mean they share everything. Maybe they just share a piece of it. And I think it's something, I think sharing tends to increase as kids begin to trust you more. Um, now with younger children, sometimes I think what you get is they pour out everything from their world and it's easy to get overwhelmed and lost in it. Um, but yeah, helping the child to help you understand what's going on in their world, understand what's going on in the classroom, you know, understand why they're, you know, so tired, understanding how come they're in a bad mood, you know, to really see if they'll open that window for, for you. Um, and trying to find a way, if you can, for your kiddos to get involved in things. Um, I know with the children that we work with, it's really difficult because there's not um, sometimes the parental support or the spare time to do a lot of volunteering. Um, but, you know, just kind of talk about ways that they can help out at school. Um, or if your child comes and says that they're involved in something at school, like a recycling program, then really encourage that. And um, my tutoring tip is to do something yourself that contributes to their overall good of your community. Because then again, you're, you're kind of a role model and you can share with them what that is. And again, it feels good. It feels good to give back. It feels good for us as adults, which is one of the reasons I think we do the tutoring. And it feels good for our kids, so to kind of help them find ways. Um, coping. I think exploring the relationship, helping our kids understand that there's a relationship between stress and their ability to do work. Um, because as adults, we all kind of understand that, um, or hopefully we do, although it's still sometimes I'll be struggling and it'll take me a while to realize um, that I'm really stressed out or I didn't sleep enough. Kids, especially some of the kids we deal with who, again, are thrown into very difficult situations a lot maybe not, they may not be able to see that connection. So I think it's important for us to let them know if they come into a session and it's just really not going well and they seem exhausted, you know, that's a great um, education time for you. That's a great time for you as a tutor to say, well, you know, when you get tired, it makes it really hard to learn. It makes it really hard to concentrate. Um, that's just how our brain works. So setting it up is, again, forming that connection for them. And also that it's not a personal failure on their part. You know, the fact that they can't come in and always concentrate doesn't mean that they somehow have failed. Um, and I think that we can share, and when I say share in a, um, effective in the moment coping skills, that means if your kid is saying that, or maybe they come in and they're highly anxious and they just can't focus, and um, they just can't, they just can't, Maybe you guys get up and take a walk. You know, you take a walk around the library. You go look out the window. You go listen to birds. You, you do something to give yourself a break. And in that way, you're kind of modeling for them um, a coping skill that can, you know, show them how to make a difference in their own life. Like when I get stressed, oh, yeah, I met with the tutor that time, and I was really, you know, um, feeling anxious. I'm sure they wouldn't use that word, but feeling really anxious, and we got up and did, you know, X, Y, or Z. Um, it's also important if, you know, if you do have a kid who's feeling anxious, and maybe they don't know what to call that, but you can look at them and tell they just seem to be all, you know, antsy and nervous, helping them put a label on that. And I'm not trying to turn everybody into therapists, but I mean, it's just really a very simple modeling thing we can do. It's like, oh, well, you know, when I act like that or when I feel like that, I, I'm kind of anxious. Do you think that's what's going on with you? Um, you know, um, modeling help-seeking behaviors. Again, a lot of our kids, I think, are very reluctant to ask for help, either because it hasn't been there in the past um, 
or they've just had a bad experience with it. So, you know, modeling, if you're struggling with math, you know, modeling calling somebody. Um, if you can't find something and you're in a library or, you know, model for them going and asking someone for help rather than doing without, because I think it's important for them to see that. Um, so my challenge for you is to, you know, use yourself as an example. I know that um, when I tutored, lots of times there are unanticipated situations that arrange, uh, that arise, sorry. Um, so for example, I will show up to tutor a child and the room we're supposed to be in is locked. <laughs> And you can't get in, and you're not getting in. So, you know, how we deal with those situations can be really very, very powerful learning moments. So, you know, in theory, the way we want to deal with them is by finding an alternative. Like, okay, then we'll meet out on the playground. Or maybe we'll go sit in the principal's office. Or maybe, you know, we'll try to find a different solution rather than just, you know, kind of getting stuck in the anger and the frustration and the, oh my gosh, they've done this to me three weeks in a row. You know, that's sort of what we want to leave behind in the session and maybe call whoever the next day and work on that one. Um, but I do think that it's really important that, that they um, see us dealing with difficult situations in a healthy manner, which, um, you know, means trying to find a solution to it. And uh, my tutor tip is engage in self-care, because that's one of the most important things that we can do as tutors is take care of ourselves, because that will allow us to take care of our kiddos. Um, character is, again, you know, showing the child that they're, they are important to you, that they're important to you just because of who they are, not because of what they do, not because of the grade that they got, not because you made it through the, you know, 40-page homework packet, but um, just that because of who they are. And let them explain to you. And they will if you give them the opening of, you know, kind of what matters in their life. Um, but also, you know, I think as a tutor, we have a responsibility to provide our kids with a sense of right and wrong, not from any political or religious standpoint, but just from, from a human standpoint. Um, I know that I worked with a number of kids at um, the library where there are a lot of homeless adults. And, you know, a number of the kids I've worked with, when someone comes in who's homeless, they will immediately say something like, you know, look at that bum. Oh, I bet he's got a gun. Oh, you know, I just just really remarks that kind of bring you up short, especially when you think that you're, you're you know, working with children who are homeless too. So I think it's really important for us as tutors to step in in those points and say, you know, why, you know, how come you think that? And he probably is just having a rough time. You know, sometimes people just really have struggle. And, you know, sometimes one of the struggles is in not having a stable place to live. And, you know, I hope he's here, you know, getting on the computer and maybe he'll be able to find some help or whatever, you know, however you phrase it. But to really make sure that you somehow step in, not in an angry way, but just sort of in a way of helping them sort of, um, you know, reframe, reframe that. Because I think, well, I know a lot of our kids carry a tremendous amount of shame and you see it in moments like that come out. Um, so I think that that's, you know, developing some, some character is really important for our kids. Um, and so my challenge for you is to, you know, engage your students in conversations that address injustice. So that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, on any global or grand scheme. That may mean um, the kid at school who stole their pencil and then they turned around and stole the kid's, you know, backpack. I've had that one happen before. Or the kid at school who, you know, did X, Y, and Z and was mean to them. So really talking about that, you know, well, what would it have been like if you would have gone and, you know, let the teacher know that he took your pencil, you know, rather than stealing the backpack and then kind of following that through, that stealing the backpack got them in trouble. And it will be your own example. But yeah, really kind of looking at those, because those, those, um, those opportunities will absolutely come up if you're talking to your kids about kind of how their day went or how their week went. Um, I think those opportunities come up a lot for kids who live in shelters. 
and you will definitely get some opportunities to kind of reframe things for them and help them identify other things they could have done. Um, my tutor tip, and I, I'm not sure if this fits in here, but I always want to have it any presentation I do, is never tie a student's performance or behavior to your needs. Um, and by your needs, what I mean is, um, you know, I'm kind of a perfectionist, and I always want to feel like I did everything right. And when I'm in a tutoring situation, I seem to always wanting to be want to be pleasing the teacher or the principal or whoever. So remembering that a kid not making it through their whole homework packet, maybe not turning in a project on time, that is not a reflection of you as a tutor. You know, it may be a reflection of the reality of the situation, the child not feeling well, whatever. I mean, we meet with our kids one hour a week. So really never, you know, looking at our performance as being tied to our kids' performance, I think is, is a very important um, skill. Um, the last part is, you know, I think the work we do, I think working with the children we work with, I think it is hard work. Um, the more in relationship you get with your kids, the more you're going to find out about their lives. Um, and sometimes that can be very hard to deal with. Um, because they have a lot going on. And the more safe you become in that relationship, then the more your child's going to share with you too. So I think it's very important that we set boundaries for ourselves. And, um, you know, that may be boundaries with teachers. It may be boundaries with homework. For me, um, the boundaries is setting expectations. When I um, first started working with a first grader about five years ago, honestly, they would get homework packets that were probably 12 pages long. Um, and this family was homeless, living under a bridge. Dad, I don't think, could read. So it wasn't going to happen with the family. So the teacher wanted us to get it done. Um, and that was just simply, it was completely unrealistic. So again, setting those boundaries with especially, um, I think sometimes the school system saying, okay, but I'm meeting with them for an hour, so what do you want us to focus on, given that we're meeting for one hour once a week. And I think it's really important to do that. Um, to be flexible, you know, again, kids don't show up, families move, um, spaces don't work out like we want them to, books get forgotten. I mean, there's a lot that happens. So just being really flexible with yourself and with your kids. Um, being in community with others, you know, talking to other tutors, um, talking to other people who are involved, you know, in the field, talking to people who are involved in the field, just keeping in contact with others, self-compassion, which is, I think, very easy to say, but very difficult to do. That means that we are feeling that we're holding ourselves in a, in a view of compassion. Um, recognizing that the struggles we face are the struggles of humankind. It's not just about you. It's not just about me. Um, that there really is a sense we are all in this together um, and everything else that we all know to do. Um, and my last thing is, you know, in this world, birds, birds fall down hardly noticed. In our times, birds fall down hardly noticed in the world. Um, and I think to some extent that describes our kids. A lot of the children we work with, to me, is that they are hardly noticed and they do fall down. And it's, you know, blame is either too great to assess or it's nobody's fault or it's everyone's fault. Um, and none of that really matters when we're in relationship with that child. I think it is our job to notice them. We really do. And I think sometimes that gets very difficult, but it is our job. Um, so basically, you know, we've gone over quite a bit, the three C's. Um, and the connection part, the relationship, the relationship is what's going to carry all of them. And I think when you can do this with your child, you kind of become that, that surface that they can bounce back from. You know, you're teaching these skills. And anytime we teach a skill, a relationship skill, um, 
a moment when we can, you know, talk about character, a moment where we can reframe a situation for our kids. Anytime we do that, then, you know, from, again, um, a neurobiological standpoint, we are kind of creating a new, a new circuitry in the brain. So we're creating everything, um, everything leaves an impact. Everything leaves an impact in the brain. So when we can change things a little bit, we're creating a new, a new way to think for our kids. And I think that's all I've got. Thank you, Renee. I've been doing a lot of head nodding over here. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't I really say. appreciate it. No, no, it, it, what you have been saying is right, you know, spot on, and I think it's very helpful for our tutors, and I think they can relate to all the obstacles. Um, we do have about 15 minutes for questions, and I really encourage you to um, type in any questions or, like, even if it's a specific issue that you've encountered, um, then tap into Renee's expertise. Um, she's definitely someone to ask these things to, and she can... Um, give you some answers. We do. We have one question about um, how these techniques can be applied to group tutoring settings because we do have some t tutors who work with um, multiple students at one time, maybe even up to ten. And I know it's hard to build relationships, and you don't want to um, put anyone on the spot when you know when there's multiple children involved. Do you have any tips? on how to navigate that or maybe what strategies are more important or, or applicable? Again, I think that I would really focus on, you know, even if it is a group, so you're there meeting with like five, ten kids? Sometimes it's one tutor with like five okay. students or sometimes it's like three tutors with ten students total and they kind of alternate. They kind of go yeah. back and forth. In our learning centers, that's um, primarily the way that they work is you know, they bounce around to different students. And, um, there's you know, that could be up to 30 at one, okay. one room, and that that's a little unusual. But but we do have group tutoring in other situations. Okay. Um, well, I think if if you wanted, to, and it would be more difficult in that situation. Um, but I think returning to the basic thing that you want to do, the most important thing is that relationship. So setting up from the beginning, maybe um, you know, attempting to know everybody's name. Even if it means if you've got access to a, a chalkboard or something, or a whiteboard, I'm showing my age here, um, you know, write the name down, and, you know, then attempt with them to have them come up with what is your goal. So, you know, even if you've got 30 students, maybe the overall message can be that you get their name down and that, that they kind of come up with a goal, or you guys can come up with a goal together, or... Um, or as a group. I, I think the name thing is super, super important because I think that acknowledges um, who they are and that they are there. So again, I think if I had to focus somewhere, I would focus um, definitely on identifying them and setting up the name and having them, um, you know, do that part of it. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think, you know, another question that's come up is that um, when we work with our students, we want to make sure to establish healthy boundaries and, you know, our tutors are there in a more professional role to mm -hmm. work with academics, but we do realize that some mentoring <coughs> takes place in relationship building. I guess maybe could you give some insight into how soon you jump into certain aspects of, of you know, that connection or relationship building or how when to kind of know when to back off a little bit? And, um, okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I think that that is really important because, again, we do have boundaries with our kids, and our primary goal is to help them with their school issues. Um, I think that the tool, actually, for a lot of what we're talking about, the seven Cs, the tool, if you are the 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 vehicle can definitely be the, the tutoring, the educational piece, because through that, we're going to have the chance to really model for our students dealing with frustration, dealing, you know, with, um, dealing with a number of issues that are coming back, showing flexibility. So we're going to be able to model a lot of those skills by just doing what we do, reaching for help. You know, we'll be able to model a lot of that. Um, as far as, so I think the question is, solving the problems or? I guess how to know 
where the boundaries are and not to like strive to have this close relationship with the student you know that may not come about right away when, to, when oh to that's true that. and and you know again realizing that you are part of that so kind of our job as tutors I think is to be there open is to be there and to be um, open to the kids to set up the structure of the session so it feels safe and again you know the beginning and ending rituals and then how that child connects to us and even if that child connects to us is really um, up to them in a lot of ways. I mean, we can be there, we can be present, and we can be focused on what we're doing, and the goal is for them to connect to us through that activity. Um, not, you know, not as a therapist, not as a social worker. And if something comes up that the child tells us about that we really can't, um, don't know what to do with, to remember, you know, that we are, I think, are they mandated reporters as tutors? Not or as tutors, not yeah, as but tutors. we are as an organization. But as an organization, you know, so talk to, talk to someone else in the organization, um, you know, one of the regional coordinators and say, you know, this came up in my session and it really concerns me about this child, um, because that can happen. Um, but I think the relationship, again, if you're open and you're present, the relationship will come about through the work that you're doing, because that's how you're connecting. So did that answer that? And I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> we still have a few more minutes for questions, so please type them in as you, um, if you've jotted anything down or thought about anything while we were talking. Uh, I might be putting you on the spot. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I wanted to go back to boundaries really mm -hmm. quickly, because that is something that um, I kind of, glossed over. I did a training um, several years ago that really focused on how trauma impacts kids' ability to learn. And so that one focused more on, drama, on boundaries. Um, I think the important thing to remember is that we alone, um, we are not the only ones responsible for this child. And that there may be times when, um, yeah, other organizations, other um, agencies have to be brought in to help this child and you know accept that that's part of it that that's outside of our area um, of expertise and that's you know we're not doing them any good if we kind of stay with them in a situation where we know that where we know there are some issues and things like that can come up when I met with my first kiddo um, I showed up for the session and I have allergies and my nose was running <laughs> really badly and she asked me, she said, are you doing cocaine again? <laughs> I was like, oh, wait a second. Um, no. <laughs> so that, it was, it was, it's interesting the mindset that she came in in. Um, as we got to know each other, she found out I was married. And her question was, when are you getting divorced? <laughs> so just there are some assumptions that, you know, we make of our kids and our kids make of us. And um, her, in her sessions, as the relationship did develop, there did, Sometimes when, um, you know, I reports did have to be made, and I did go to my regional coordinator, and so that may happen. And remembering that that's just kind of part of it, unfortunately, with this population. Mm -hmm. We had another question: How do I deal with a parent who is dominating the session? So I guess kind of inhibiting learning. No, well, because they're just always present. Um, and sometimes negative. That's what I've experienced. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're creating a lot of negativity towards the student when you're trying to create, you know, they're focusing on their strengths. If you have the ability to talk with the parent um, separate from the child, maybe a phone call prior to the session um, and just, you know, kind of put some boundaries in and say, you know, part of the School on Wheels program and always refer it back to the agency. Um, so it's not you, it's not, it's not you saying, hey, I want, you know, it's part of the School on Wheels program is that, you know, the child and tutor really meet and focus, um, you know, kind of without the parent, because this is our time to also give you a break. Is there something you would really like to see happen or that you're concerned about, you know, during our sessions? Um, and try to, you know, go at it from that way, finding out from them what is or isn't happening. I think sometimes what happens, though, is that 
um, the parents oftentimes miss that connection. Um, they want that relationship too. So not necessarily in a jealous way, but they really want to be a part of that. And or they see you connecting to their child in ways that maybe they can't, and there may be some jealousy. Or, you know, it, it can even be something going on in the family that they, they really don't want, they want to make sure the tutor doesn't know. You know, there's all kinds of stuff that can go on. So again, I would, I would try to address it with the parent on the phone, um, or you know, in private, and and pushing again the agency. School on Wheels' primary responsibility is for the tutor and child to meet. Is there something that is or is not happening that you would like for me to work on? And just to add to that, we would be happy to have that conversation with the parents, meaning uh, we be, meaning the regional coordinators or representative from School on Wheels, because we know that sometimes you're just not comfortable. Yeah. Um, so please just uh, approach your regional coordinator about that, and we can we can figure out how to resolve that. There was one more question about um, bullying, and bullying comes up quite often. Um, maybe in students talk about it to their tutors, or uh, just in general between students. Sometimes in the group situation, any tips for addressing those concerns? Um, with bullying, I think one of the the major things is to always 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 encourage your kids to talk to somebody at the school um, and I actually I worked for um, a couple of years at a, a psychiatric hospital with adolescents and bullying was almost across the board something that every adolescent in that hospital um, had experienced and the majority of the them had never ever talked to anyone at the school. Um, so it, it's almost, it kind of ties your hands as a tutor. And again, I think that that's one of those areas where boundaries really come in because a child telling us <clears throat> about bullying is, is kind of, well, they're sort of letting us know, but at the same time, you know, unless they're giving us permission to tell someone it's really not something that's going to help them. So I think really talking to them about figuring out who the person is at the school that they could go to, how that conversation could go, maybe you know getting books on bullying because there are a number of books at all different grade levels um, that focus on bullying because it has become so pervasive. Um, and again, our kids are particularly at risk for being bullied. They're you know lots of times the new kids at school. Um, but again, just really, really encouraging them, talking to them about if they told their parent, if their parent's a safe person to tell, you know, what, what they can do in the school. And then if it does get left to that point where you're really concerned about a child in a bullying situation, I would definitely call your regional um, supervisor and um, see if maybe you know, you can get it in with the school to let them know what goes on because um, it's a very dangerous thing, especially in adolescence. Mm -hmm. um, one, one more question here. How do I deal with my student who clearly has learning difficulties? Um, one of the first things I would do would be contact the school and see if you can contact his teacher or her teacher and find out if there's um, a diagnosis. Is it is it like um, you know a, di a diagnosed learning disability, like ADD or ADHD or dyslexia, and there are so many types of dyslexia. So that's probably where I would start is finding out if it is um, something like that, and then you can kind of do the research and get some um, what's the word I'm looking about some some resources mm -hmm. that can help them deal with that. Um, you know, talking to the teacher can be a really, really good thing. The other thing is, if, especially if it's kids with ADD, like I worked with a kid, kiddo who had ADD, and um, the family did not want her medicated, and um, that was fine. But what we would do is just really have to taper the, the expectations of the session, because you can only go so long, and then you need to take a break. So we would almost build that in and discuss it about, okay, we're going to take a break now so we can bring your focus back. So I think also talking to your kids, you know, um, 
I had a little boy who had a really bad speech impediment to the extent that I couldn't understand him. So one of the first things we did was talk about, you know, how do other people work with you with this? Is it okay if I ask you to point things if I don't know what you're talking about? You know, and so really working with your kid about what's going on with them too. But yeah, I, again, I would start with the teacher in the school system though. Well, I think we're out of time, but I, um, any final thoughts that you wanted to provide? Um, I think my final thoughts are, again, that this is a lot more complicated than it seems. Um, when I first started doing, my husband was just like, oh, well, you're just going and reading to a kid. <laughs> I was like, well, it's a little more than that. So to remember that and to remember that, um, you know, to keep the boundaries in place and remember that we have this piece of it and to always, always, always bring in other people to help us out. I mean, you've got a great staff at School on Wheels and to never, ever feel like you have to be the one who deals with this all by yourself. Um, I think that that's the most important thing is as you're connecting to your child and forming that relationship for you to make sure that you're forming relationships too within, within the community and, and with school and this. Mm -hmm. That's it. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for attending. Um, I will uh, email everyone who attended a copy of the handouts and they'll be posted on our website. Uh, and please do visit our website. We have other workshops from the past that you can, you can watch at any time. They're recorded and they're very valuable. But um, this one today was really a pleasure to have you, Renee. Thank you. And we appreciate you assisting our tutors and being more effective in their sessions. So thank you so much and have a good day.